Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. In the chat, please tell us who you are and where you're um, viewing us from. And then also, if you want to talk about Mother's Day plans, what are we going on? What are we doing tomorrow? Now, those brunches are have gotten extremely expensive. I don't think there's one left uh, here, at least $52 per person. And Preston's 13 now, so he's an adult, so you got to pay an adult for that. Expensive, expensive. I am cooking uh, brunch because it would be $300 just to go to brunch. So I'm going to cook brunch tomorrow morning-ish because around brunch time for everybody. Last year, uh, I grilled because everyone loves my barbecue. Donovan knows about that fish, too. Some good fish. Good catfish. Good morning, good morning. I'll leave a little bit more time uh, for people to come in, maybe a minute or so, and then we'll go ahead and get into our theme. A few more seconds, then we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, to our um, last Black History Nerd session of the 2023-2024 uh, academic year. Uh, I am LeGarrette King. I'm your HNIC, your head nerd in charge. If you're new to Black History Nerds, we're just a bunch of nerds who get up on Saturday mornings to learn and talk about Black history, culture, um, and everything within the concepts of um, Blackness. And we welcome you um to our uh, nerd series featuring our featuring our featured nerd uh abigail henry all right from west philadelphia to burlington vermont african-american history for teachers so this is the right um right uh, right zoom call for you real quick for those who are uh new we are the center for k-12 black history and racial literacy education um here is is our current staff here with myself and Brittany jones christina king Donovan James, uh, Greg, Daphne, as well as Montana, we welcome you. Um, we are a space for PK-12 teachers. Um, in effect, to um, our goal is to um, help teachers uh, teach Black history more effectively uh, and also um, explore aspects of racial literacy. And we do this through our research, our professional development, our networking, and our advocacy. For those who know about our conference, this is our seventh conference coming up this summer. It's the Teaching Black History Conference, but we have more things that we do uh, throughout the that week in which we call it Teaching Black History Week um, uh, festivities here. Um, so, of course, we have our conference. We have our writing retreat for scholars and writers who are looking for a space to collaborate, generate ideas, or simply... Um, um, have a place where they can just finish up a manuscript. All right. This is an intimate session. Um, um, this this can be a place where we can do some networking or grant writing or other writing um, projects uh, or just to keep ourselves accountable. Um, we also have a social studies coordinators retreat, which is two days before the conference. This is for social studies and curriculum professionals and leaders looking to expand knowledge on uh, Black history curriculum and instruction. Um, um, this will link you to uh, like-minded professionals uh, and leaders in the field of social studies. You get to learn from top leaders. These are practical approaches uh, for all types of school, urban, rural, suburban schools. And this is a safe space to talk about these particular issues, particularly if you are having trouble um, leading aspects of um, Black history education or racial literacy education. And of course, uh, our biggest um, 
professional development is our Teaching Black History Conference, which is the 26th to the 28th. This is a place uh, to learn innovative approaches concerning Black history education. Uh, this year, we have 76 presentations over two and a half days. This is a place where you can network with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Black history educators from around the world. Um, there will be recording and virtual options available. And again, this is a safe and sometimes I like to say a radical space uh, for us to learn, learn Black history um, and all of its um, manifestations. And so for those who are, who, who are interested, uh, here is the QR link uh, for the conference. Everything is there from hotel rooms to conference t-shirts to um, places to um, go, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, registration. For those who are attending as a regular attendee, registration is, a, is only $115. Now you have to remember, this is the only time that we charge for professional development. All of our, all the rest of our professional development are uh, free, right? But it's real important for you all to support the conference because the conference sets up our budget for next year. So if you like um, Donovan, if you like Montana, if you like Daphne, if you like all these people, uh, I can't pay them if y'all don't come to the conference, right? So then, you know, Donovan won't be on the screen next year for all the nerd sessions. If you like all the nerd sessions, we won't have 12 nerd sessions. We probably can only have one or two. So it's very important for you to sign up for the conference. Even if you're not coming, maybe you want to donate, right? $115. And so for those who um, go to education conferences, you know this is probably a $300 or $400 conference, uh, particularly for two and a half days. Um, our keynote speaker uh, this, this year will be Dr. Stephanie uh, Tolliver. Uh, and her and and her presentations, Wakanda versus everybody, a layered account of spectrophilia and dance, right? So we can't um, wait to um, hear her uh, bring down the house for that. Also, another initiative that we have is our Teaching Black History Micro Credential. This is for anybody who is interested in learning the most effective ways to teach Black history. Uh, this particular um, uh, nerd session is kind of a, a preview of what we could have for the micro credentials. Abigail is joining us next year, and she would probably be the primary teacher um, within the micro credential, right? So the micro credential is an academic credential for educators, which is defined, defined broadly. Um, um, this will do two things. Number one, provide a more holistic education to teachers who are teaching Black history, Black studies, and ethnic studies courses. It also provides administrators uh, a way to gauge who are the most effective Black history teachers, right? One of the most important aspects of a Black history class, particularly if it's a new Black history class, is the teacher. The teacher is the um, the front person of these particular courses. So if you know someone who teaches Black history, if you know someone who wants to bring a Black history course to their schools, uh, please pass the word for the teaching uh, Black history credential. Uh, it's only a year, uh, fall, summer, uh, uh, fall, spring, and summer. Um, and you will finish off with the teaching Black history conference um, for that summer that you are registered, right? So more information, please, uh, email me for that. Uh, there's only 1500 for the entire micro credential and you can't beat that with a stick. All right. All right. Do we still have uh, um, book club today? Yeah, right. Tim still asked one. Okay, great. So this is our last book club of the semester here. Uh, uh, Black Lives Matter at school. Uh, Montana, you want to talk a little bit about today? Yeah, so today we're just going to do a wrap up of the book and then we're going to have both of the authors come and talk to everyone and anyone can ask questions and just talk about the book. Okay, great. So if you've been to the book clubs uh, today at 1230, uh, if you want to come for this last session so you can, uh, if you can uh, talk with the authors of the book, uh, then this is your chance. The QR code is right there. Uh, yeah, and I believe if you don't have the book, the book is free. Um, maybe Greg or Montana can put the link in the um, the chat here. All right. Uh, so today is May 11th. So there's several different things going on here. Uh, May 14th is, um, oh man, is this the, 
second anniversary of the Buffalo Top shooting, right? Uh, here in Buffalo, um, New York on the east side, right? So those who are from Buffalo, uh, um, if 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 you lost someone, we we are um, we're praying for you. Um, here's um, one of our readings that you can do to kind of learn a little bit more about uh, the predominantly black area here in Buffalo, New York, which is the east side, strangers in the land of paradise uh, by um, Lillian uh, uh, Cherie Williams. Uh, so that will kind of provide you a little context of what's uh, of how the black community of Buffalo uh, came to be. Um, so for the Buffalo 10, these are the uh, individuals who lost their lives in Buffalo uh, on May 14th, 2022. If we can have uh, a moment of silence, 10 seconds, I would definitely appreciate it for reflection and prayer or, or um, however you want to use your time. So our heart goes out to the families of Roberta Dury, uh, Mark Gus Morrison, Andre McNeil, Aaron Salter, Jaredine Talley, um, Celestine Cheney, Haywood Patterson, Catherine Massey, Pearl Young, and Ruth Whitfield. Um, so um, our hearts go out uh, for those who are still struggling, those who are still trying to heal uh, uh, from that um, egregious attack on innocent um, Buffalo citizens. Also, May 17th uh, is the 70th, 75th, 70 anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education uh, for um, uh, the Center for K-12 Black History and Racial Literacy. will have an event later on this year, probably October or November on um, Brown versus Board of Education, but these are some readings that you may be interested in uh, Derek Bell's Silent Covetance, uh, Brown versus Board and Unfulfilled Hopes uh, for, for Racial Reform. And then also Mary DeZaki's uh, classic book, Cold War Civil Rights, right? Which kind of talks about uh, the concept that Brown versus Board was a Cold War um, tactic, right? Um, um, so very good books here. Uh, Derek Bell's Silent Covetance uh, and Cold War uh, Civil Rights. There would be those. Happy Mother's Day for all the mothers uh, who are joining us, um, um, you know, today. Hopefully uh, tomorrow all your families will uh, treat you like queens of uh, who you are. Uh, we do have a uh, book for those who are interested um, in mothers. And this is uh, The Three Mothers, How the Mothers of Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and James Baldwin Shaped a Nation, right? Uh, Anna Tubbs, right? So... Uh, very good book there uh, for those who are interested. Uh, and again, happy Mother's Day from the Center for K-12 Black History and Racial Literacy Education. All right. Y'all didn't come here to hear me talk and jabber and all that good stuff. So here we have uh, Mrs. Abigail Henry. Uh, she is going to be one of the newest uh, graduate fellows starting in the academic year of 2024, 2025. We are uh, so delighted to have her. Currently, she's a city of Philadelphia teacher, uh, have, has been teaching African-American history for a long time and has a wealth of knowledge. And I just love talking to her, um, you know, just about Black history and Black history education. Uh, and I learn something new every single time. So, all right, without further ado, I will pass it on to Abigail. All right, good morning, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Um, let me just start sharing my screen. Uh, get off. All right, here we go. Mm -hmm. I think we're good. Everybody can see it. Yeah, you're good, Abigail. All right, great. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy early Mother's Day to the mothers out there. Um, my name is Abigail Henry. I'm so happy to present this course that I created called African American History for Teachers. In the chat, um, what was the first topic or person you learned about in Black history? And who did you learn that from? Who did you learn it from?
I love learning where people first encountered um, Black history. Was it from a family member? Was it from a school? Was it at your church? I learned it from my father mm. who, told me, who told me about a woman where he lived at in Charleston, South Carolina, who helped him to learn and to educate him. He actually learned to be a tailor and to drive and to do things at a young age. And he was not educated um, the way we are now. So that's how I first learned about it. He told yeah. me about people in Charleston. I'll mute myself. Thank you, Barbara. I appreciate that. Barbara Ann. Barbara Ann. <laughs> um, so and I would come back to the chat and take a look at where else some of you learned it from. Um, I didn't learn it at school, right? At school, my basic introduction to African-American history was that slavery happened, I guess. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Um, then there was something called segregation and Martin Luther King saved us all from that. That was my limited high school experience. The African-American history that I truly learned about first um, was at home. I am half Trinidadian. I was born in England. My dad is Trinidadian. My mom is white. And I learned Black history first through dad telling me stories about Trinidad, specifically about the history of the steel pan. Then my, then my senior year, I read um, two books that kind of really changed my life, which was Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye and The Color of Water. Um, and then I watched The First Roots. And I remember watching clips of The First Roots and being like, what is going on here? Something is clearly missing from my high school education because what is going on in this TV show has never showed up in my high school classroom. Um, I just wanted that as a starting point because it is really fascinating to me um, now that I'm in my 40s to look at the ways in which we people first initially engage with African-American history. Um, I have been teaching African-American history now for 12 years. I've been teaching ninth grade African-American history at a charter school in West Philadelphia. And this year I'm piloting the AP African-American studies course. Um, I've been content lead for the network for about um, eight years. I've worked with Ishmael Jimenez on working on the updating the national curriculum because in Philadelphia, if you go to the school district, you are required to take African-American history. It's been that way for 20 years. And they have been working on updating the curriculum. Uh, a few years ago, I won a Pulitzer grant to incorporate the 1619 project. I've been doing that in two units, and I'm working actually on two more. And I recently founded um, the Black Cabinet as an LLC uh, to provide consulting to schools and organizations and companies looking for um, high quality Black history resources. That's an image of my Scrabble team. They're called the Word Ninjas, um, something I did outside of school for fun. I, my teaching philosophy, I love inquiry-based lessons. I love trying to be as creative as possible, incorporating art. We use a lot of maps in my classroom. The Sankofa bird is a big symbol that uh, we use. Um, I do a lot of mock trials, debates, um, and written assignments that I've come up with on my own. So I'm just going to give you um, a brief overview of the course and talk about the starting points. I was just saying to Professor King, like, consider the next, like, 15 minutes African-American history 101 in, like, a flash 15 minutes. Um, this is the course that I teach throughout the school year. Now, in part period one, students start with a student argumentative response, which I will get into. Then I do a unit one, framing the course. Unit two is Mother Africa. And unit three is the modern world system, so um, the Atlantic slave trade. Report period two, we do another SAR. Then I do a unit on the revolutionary era. Um, unit two is Road to the Civil War and Lincoln. Uh, report period three, uh, reconstruction, domestic terrorism and strategic response. Report period four is the myth of American exceptionalism, um, emerging black thought, identity, and activism. That's a whole lot right there. 
Um, but that's the way in which I have divided the units for teaching African-American history. Some of the unit titles overlap with the school districts of Philadelphia's and some of them are ones that I've created on my own. So um, I was hired by St. Michael's College to develop a course called African-American History for Teachers. That course was completely virtual, taught over about 13 weeks. And as I was designing the course, the question I asked myself was, how can I pick any one or two lessons from each unit that would provide the, uh, the most richness in terms of conversation and content for the students and participants to fully um, develop an understanding of African-American history? You should also know that like 100% of my students in West Philly are students of color, uh, predominantly from Philly. I also have about 20 to 25% of my students being from um, of Caribbean descent and 30% of my students are Muslim. When I teach the St. Mike's course, it is 100%, at least this past time, was 100% white women. So it's been very interesting for me to go from teaching 13, 14, 15 year old black history in person to teaching predominantly white women um, on Zoom. First week of school, uh, and let me just back up for a second. So what are you gonna see in this presentation, this nerd session is kind of a combination of some of the assignments I do with my ninth graders and some of the assignments that I have modified um, to teach ad adults um, African-American history virtually. The first week of school with my ninth graders, um, I always go big or go home. Um, I tell them about the first day I was called uh, the N-word, saying to them like one of my biggest goals for the course is that when they walk out of the classroom, not only do they feel good about themselves, but they have strategies that they can use to confront racism. Because when I was called that N-word, I didn't tell anyone. And I um, it wasn't until I got to college till I wrestled with that. And so I say to I say to them, I don't want your experience um, to be mine, where I wasn't able to um, find ways to talk about race. I then do a quick mini unit on Meek Mill. This is the one that I presented at the Teaching Black History Conference last year. Um, Philly, Meek Mill is a hero to black kids, especially that song Dreams and Nightmares is like Philadelphia's national anthem. Um, I also go over um, my classroom rules. I won't spend too much time on that. Just check out number two, where we talk a lot about just honoring black people's humanity and diversity. Um, in that mini unit, this is something they do. We do every report period where we will study a current issue of race. Students have to summarize that issue in one paragraph and then suggest a strategy on how to fix it in the second paragraph. So for example, with Meek Mill, summarize what happened to him in terms of his experience with the probation system. And in the second paragraph, how would you fix the probation system? You can see the grading criteria there. Um, I use the same criteria for each of these types of units. Um, this Meek Mill lesson plan, it's a like a four day lesson plan is available for free on Teachers Pay Teachers. In that portfolio link, you should be able to find a link to that lesson if you are interested. All right, my first day in Vermont though, it looks very different teaching with adult, adults. It's really important to set norms regarding discussions about race and I model a lesson for them so they can get like a taste of what my teaching style is like. Um, we use the courageous conversations norms, and then I've added two specific ones for black history, recognizing black people's humanity and diversity and past oppression impacts today's racism. We spend a solid like hour just talking about the norms, um, just so that we can have buy-in and really build a safe slash uh, brave space. Um, I then, the first thing I do in my Vermont course is model a lesson on George Washington and Una Judge and um, have a rigorous conversation about why he was unable to ca capture one of his um, enslaved people. In both settings, uh, no matter what, we always do an African-American history affirmation. Um, in my high school class, I'll say I am and all the students together will say I am my past, my present and my future. 
I'll say this is, and they will say, this is my school in my community and I make it shine. We do that no matter what, right before um, I read what the objective is. Um, at St. Mike's, I have one person each week come off of Zoom um, and just say the affirmation with me. Okay, so where can I get the most out of a lesson um, in terms of teaching Black history? Well, I've identified certain lessons that I think students most enjoyed, and those lessons are the ones that I brought to St. Mike's. So, for example, in my Mother Africa unit, we do a lesson on African mass. For the development of the modern world system, I do a lesson that I've created on the division of field versus housework. Um, for the revolutionary era, I do a lesson that I created for the Pulitzer Center on 1619 versus 1776. And then I also talk um, about Lincoln for that road to the Civil War. For a reconstruction unit, I do a lesson on Hiram Rebels and one of the first speeches that he gave um, as a member of Congress. Um, for domestic terrorism or racialized terrorism, I do a lesson on Ida B. Wells, a speech she gives about lynching. Uh, I always wanna spend more time on Du Bois, Washington and Garvey. My ninth graders debate him. We spend one day of, on each of him. We have another two days where we're looking at primary sources where they're talking about each other and then they debate who has the best strategy. Um, uh, virtually, I pretty much do the same thing and I'm able to make that work um, in about two hours since most of the students have done their homework on the readings by them beforehand. For the myth of American exceptionalism, um, it, I thought it was appropriate for students at St. Mike's to read King's letter from Birmingham jail. And then we talk about Malcolm X's reference to the house while um, students also read an excerpt from Cast. And then to close out, you know, every year, um, I close out with my ninth graders differently. It depends on whether or not I have laptops. It kind of depends like what they're interested in and what like I'm motivated by. So um, this year I am doing a mini unit with my ninth graders on reparations. And then at St. Mike's, um, I kind of take that meek mill that I start my ninth graders with and I actually end the course that way with them. All right, so what I'm gonna do, let me check the time. Okay, I'm doing all right, 11.28. I'm gonna just show you a little bit of some of those um, lessons that I've created. I've tried to make it a little bit interactive so you can just get a taste of what my classroom is like. Um, and then of course, at the end, I can an answer any questions you have, perhaps about specific lessons or how I design a unit. All right, so for the Mother Africa unit, um, I love African mass as artifacts. Um, I have both the ninth graders and the adults read about different types of African mass. We talk about the mass in the Black Panther movie. Um, my ninth graders, two years ago, I was so fortunate to have a, a art teacher on the ninth grade team. And so the ninth graders studied the mass and designed a concept for making a mask in my room and then spent a week in the art teacher's room making the mask. Um, as I plan on exiting the classroom, it's I'm definitely saving some student work. Um, this is one mask that a student made that I am absolutely in love with. Um, I'm going to frame it. This mask um, just like reflects on leaning on our ancestors and the journey of the uh, Middle Passage. All right, by the time we've gone through the Africa unit, um, we are ready to start talking about slavery. Obviously, one of my biggest pieces of advice when teaching African-American history, it does not start with slavery. That's why you must time, spend time in Africa first. Uh, this is a poster from my classroom where it's really important to go over the difference between slave and enslaved person. I tell students I do not want them to use the word slave in their writing. I say if we are reading it from a primary source, that is OK, but if you are writing um, about people who are involved in slavery. You should be using enslaved African, enslaved African-American or enslaved person, um, along with some of the other uh, vocabulary um, that I encourage in my room. All right, so how do you, where's the starting point for engaging students um, after you finished a unit on Africa and all of its beauty and engaging them in slavery? Um, can you in the chat box, like, 
what do you see? Just do the, the C and the thing. What do you see in the image? And what do you think is going on? If I can get one or two people to do the C and the thing for me, I would appreciate it. Confidence and power, absolutely. Yep. Whenever we're looking at images, I always tell students to pay attention to their accessories. This man has something in his hair. He's got earrings on. He's clearly been like going to the gym. Look at his, he's been working out. Um, just having, he's obviously has some sort of power and authority. Um, just because of his stature, he's like commanding presence. I then ask him, you know, what do you see, think, wonder, um, now that you've seen the entire image and my kids are like, oh no, he did not. What a traitor. He's selling his own people. Come on now. And this allows them to start talking about, um, how, well, Ishmael calls it servitude, right? The servitude or slavery that exist existed in Africa prior to the Europeans sh showing up. We have conversations, how it was not based on race. Um, that concept though is, is, um, challenging for a 13 year old to understand where those at St. Mike's are able to, what helps them have this conversation even further is a conversation is a lesson on King Alfonso from the kingdom of Congo. I absolutely love his letter to, um, King John, where he's like begging for forgiveness. He's talking about his kingdom falling apart those two lessons on their own allow for a starting point to engage into um, the Atlantic slave trade even, even further. All right, so that's RP1, kind of in a nutshell. Um, RP2, I do a lesson, many lessons on the revolutionary era, not so much focused on the Revolutionary War itself, um, but Black people and the founding fathers, what Black people were doing to resist at that time. Um, I asked this question. This is from the lesson that was published for the Pulitzer Center. A beautiful house has been built. Who would you want to meet? The architect who designed it or the construction worker who built it? The architect being the founding fathers, the construction worker being the enslaved people. We come back to that after students read an excerpt from Nicole Hannah Jones's Democracy essay and um, a conservative article from National Review um, that was that they release every year on the 4th of July. What my students have found is that both dates are important, but let's not deny 1619 being taught as well, right? There's been a lot of criticism over Nicole Hannah Jones and um, the 1619 project and students like, you know, I cannot, they're like, we can't understand that. Why not have a conversation about what, about the year 1619 being important. So I divide them up. I do this with the adults as well. They get assigned 1619 or 1776. They have no choice on which date um, and they have to make arguments about which date um, is more important. Just had to throw this in there because this was just so much fun. It's one of the things that I'm going to miss from the classroom the most. Um, we do a lesson about the founding fathers and their role with um, their relationship with slavery. And, you know, new teacher of me struggled to teach about the founding fathers. And I feel like only after about five years, I figured it out. Not only do they want to talk about their relationship with slavery, but they want to talk about their hairlines. There was a conversation on like which founding father had the best hairline. And then that kind of led to like who has the best rap name. So Thomas Jefferson was little TJ. John Adams was Johnny Boy. George Washington was G. Weezy. And Ben Franklin <laughs> was uh, Big Frank. I have to say, I think uh, Big Frank was my favorite. Uh, okay, so... That's RP2. Um, RP3, think, ooh, I think it's out of order, the Lincoln one. Okay, I'll come back to domestic terrorism. I added this last minute. Um, 
Lincoln. He's one of my absolute favorite units to teach. Um, in the chat box, please. I know it's a complex question, kind of um, doesn't really make sense, but just give it a chance. Is there a difference between being a little racist and really, really racist? Do you think there's a difference? No. No? I 100% agree with you. Um, when we get to Lincoln, I always say he is incredibly complicated. I was taught that he freed the slaves. That is not the whole story whatsoever. We literally look at his words. We say, we look at what does he say publicly versus privately? Um, what is he saying about black people? What is he saying about his own beliefs? What is he saying about the country? And this, uh, Lincoln wrote this in a private letter. I don't have the date in front of me, but it was before he was president. He says, I cannot but hate indifference for slavery spread. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. He goes on. And then he goes on to say, you know, I just like slavery. I confess to, to see the poor creatures hunted down. My students are like, what? I'm not a creature. Is he calling me an animal right now? Just having a conversation over this specific quote and the fact that he's saying it privately, but it's, he's also saying um, he dislikes slavery leads to a question about um, Lincoln's own racism if he's referring to Black people in that regard. And I was like, well, you know, if he f supposedly freed the slaves, why is he calling um, Black people creatures? Uh, we also, in my class, when we put um, Abraham Lincoln on trial, we do a mock trial on whether or not he's a true hero of African-American freedom. Okay, so that's RP2. Um, RP3, I'm not going over a lot of lessons for RP3. I must be honest, like RP3 content is more challenging for me to teach, um, especially in terms of trying to keep it um, as positive and empowering as possible. Um, definitely, that's why I love focusing on Ida B. Wells, uh, where they read a speech that she wrote um, about lynching. We also then do a debate between Washington, Du Bois, and Garvey. Washington and Du Bois have traditionally been put always against each other. Um, that does not include a Black nationalist perspective, so I've always added Marcus Garvey. I have students debate not who is like the best leader, but who offers, whose strategy offers the best solution. This is something I have my students in class um, debate, and then also I have um, the teachers at St. Mike's. They get into groups, they get into breakout rooms, they come up with a couple arguments about whatever person I've assigned them, strategy being the most effective. Okay, that's RP3. RP4, my other, like, just really near and dear to my heart is teaching about African Americans and the military. Um, that letter uh, written by James Th Thompson, should I sacrifice myself to live half American? It's one of my absolute phrase, um, favorites. Um, I just think a lot about Black people being so brave enough that they want to fight for a country that didn't fight for them, especially in the ways in which they were treated when they came home. Uh, specifically in Philly, I did not know this until a few years ago. We had a transit strike during World War II. Um, there's a primary source image here. We can drive tanks. Why not trolleys? Eight Black men got promoted to the position of driver. And because of that, the entire city shut down. Um, white people protested that Black people were able to drive a trolley. It's so absolutely ridiculous. And so the military was sent in, not to support the Black community, but because Philly was the third largest producer of war material, um, we couldn't have war material production going down. Um, so the military was sent in to stop the strike. Uh, for this, um, my students actually was able to work with a comic book company, um, True Fiction, where they just came up with a story about an NAACP officer um, working during that time. 
All right, for RP4, I feel like I've mentioned um, Birmingham. I have the teachers, not not the my students read letter from Birmingham jail. And then for Malcolm X, um, we look at a couple of videos, we read Ballot to the Bullet, and we talk about, you know, to what extent are some of his arguments relevant today. After that, it depends on, like I said, like the mood I'm in. Sometimes we Right now, my students are studying the Black Panther Party, then I plan to do reparations, and then they might do a Sankofa mixtape. All right, let me just take the last five minutes to show you um, some assignments. I At St. Mike's, the first assignment they do is where they reflect on their early learning of African American history compared to what they're doing um, in the, um, what they're learning in my course. I obviously do not, um, assign this right away. I have to wait until students have spent some time with the content. Uh, my second assignment is um, they watch the Baldwin Buckley debate. Um, has the American dream been uh, achieved at the expense of the American Negro was the question for that debate. What was your initial reaction? Um, how relevant is that conversation today? My assignment three, which um, they reported really liking, was I had students make a Black history vision board where they had to incorporate two Black history principles. This should be something you are able to hang up in your classroom. It should not focus on just contributions of Black people in your state, but rather a deeper reflection of the experiences and history of Black people's identities and communities. Um, I had one Vermont teacher make a vision board about environmental racism, the areas of the vision board that have images, titles, and other visuals are the areas of the states where communities of color experience the highest cumulative impact, environmental disparity. I thought that vision board was incredible. And she did print it out and it's currently hanging up in her classroom. She also had her students make uh, vision boards. Um, Two other students in Vermont focused on black jewelry and black farming. These are just some images from their vision boards. They too, which they printed um, and hung up in their classroom. Obviously it's the Northeast um, farming as well as a big thing in Vermont, just 17 of the 7,000 farms are black owned. Um, that is something that I did not know either. Um, and then lastly, even though it was a course that I was giving at a, a small liberal arts college in Vermont, I did have one student from California that zoomed in and joined us. And she focused on like fair housing and education in the San Bernardino's area of California. So her vision board was about that. Where some of my St. Monks, St. Mike students were most grateful was the time I had them spending doing a Black History Month proposal. Teachers often want to do, often want to create and do something for their school for Black History Month. But by the time they get to February, um, they're tired and it takes a lot of energy. They're grading papers, they're contacting families. And so the fact that I had them create a Black History Month proposal early in the school year. Many of them said, thank you for getting this done, having us do this now, because I'm definitely going to implement this um, when I get to February. And so for their Black History Month proposal, they had to include an email to the supervisor boss principal about what they wanted to do, a Google slide deck that could be presented to staff to get them on board, and an exemplar slash sketch of what would be created. And so, for example, this is one student's email that they drafted to their um, principal about learning African textiles. She found some examples and then she even created her own exemplar. Um, another elementary school teacher focused on the artwork of Nancy B. Price. Um, in my classroom, I just do something small with my ninth graders where they finish the Sankofa, they color the Sankofa bird and finish the sentence, I am black and beautiful because this has been a yearly tradition in my room. Um, we stand in a circle and everyone reads theirs out loud. I am black and beautiful because it is a moment of just like pure black joy. And I have so many of them that when I'm like pumping them up to do this, I'll like find um, older siblings or cousins 
So I could be like, look at what your cousin did. Let's see what you're going to do next. And then lastly, um, the, their final project at St. Mike's for African-American history for teachers is to either create a lesson unit or something for their company. I'm not too like stringent on what exactly I want them to do. I just say, I want it to be something you will actually do and use in your classroom or professional setting. And so they have to do a five minute model with a Google slide deck and a two to three page reflection. Um, one middle school teacher created a unit um, inspired by Frederick Douglass talking about maybe actually, even though Vermont was the first state to get rid of slavery, it was still very unfriendly to um, African-Americans in many ways. And so she developed a unit, is Vermont truly ab abolitionist? Um, I had an elementary school teacher just focus on identity and black joy where she figured out um, and I noticed I wonder protocol that she was gonna do with six different um, African-American um, stories that she selected. All right, I think I made it for everyone. Two minutes, two minutes behind. It's eleven forty-seven. Um, there is a link that there to the my um, black cabinet portfolio. Um, I also this year had my AP students make teacher solidarity postcards that um, I mail to teachers in the United States who are facing repression um, based on their school or where they live. I still have. Um, copies of those. So if you know a Florida or Texas teacher or Arkansas or wherever who would like um, some words of encouragement, I would be happy to send them a set of the postcards that have been personally written by my seniors. Okay. All right. Great, great, great. Let's give out a hand. Good job. Good job. Good job. Uh, stop sharing for a little bit. I guess yep. I'll see everybody. Let's see. All right. Great, 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 great. All right. So we will start off with uh, any questions. So if you want to ask a question, um, um, you want to have ask, ask a question, you can unmute and ask your question. Or if you have a um, have a question in the chat, uh, Donovan in Montana can kind of look through those real quick and talk for you. Uh, let's start with uh, Ms. West. Hello, everyone. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, I was blessed by the presentation. And I am, um, I've gotten so many ideas about um, what I can do. I, I am a, a college, I teach college students right now. And so I get to have so many ideas of how I can incorporate um, my work in education, Black history, etc. But there's just so much for us to learn. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Ms. Vess. I appreciate that. All right, Ms. Reddit. Hi, let me see if I can come off camera here. Don't mind the bun. Okay, hello everyone. Miss Henry, thank you so much. This was incredible. Um, I just love seeing your unit. I love the way you either start or end with something that's locally important to your students. Um, I love the distinct kind of labels that you have for the different elements that don't maybe map onto some of the traditional things that students might see. So. I just thought this was very powerful. Um, I am a doctoral candidate at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and I work with Dr. Jarvis Givens, who has been in this space before. Um, mm -hmm. He will talk to you about our work on a, or you may be familiar that we've kind of been building a Black history curriculum around his uh, more recent book on the history of Black students. We've actually, actually worked with Ishmael to do that last summer, so it was great to hear you shouting him out, and folks in Philly have just been amazing in supporting that. Um, so I wanted to ask you in your experience as you were building your course for like the teacher education course at St. Michael's, what resources outside of your own teacher exper experience with your ninth graders did you have to look towards? I feel like you are, the work you're doing is filling a very large and important gap in graduate schools of education. I'm wondering if you're aware of other graduate schools of education that have courses on teaching Black history um, that you were able to look to or that are coming about or other spaces like this that are supporting teachers um, in doing this work? No, I mean, that's a really good question. I get the question just um, quite frequently about resources. There's not been a go-to like standardized box curriculum that, that I go to. 
um, or um, course that I have taken, right? What actually was helpful to me was going to Buffalo's Teaching Black History Conference, um, being exposed to resources there, but then also just reaching out to my network. Like I am so grateful to have Sharif Almeki as a mentor. He's the one who hired me. He was principal of my school for the first eight years. And literally when I'm stuck on teaching a specific topic, I will text him and Ishmael being like, is this the right question? Do you have a recommended reading for this? And so if you're actually, and feel free to email me, I can um, email you the syllabus to the St. Mike's course. It's a mix of just like primary sources, podcasts, video clips. It's not, it's things that I have gotten from whoever I see as like experts on any one specific topic. Because one thing is like, you know, I'm an African-American history teacher. I've got to cover like the scope of all of their curriculum. I am not necessarily a professor who has studied the kingdom of Congo for like 10 years. And actually part of my struggle with the AP African-American studies pilot is a lot of that curriculum was selected and written by professors. And then it's not necessarily um, secondary high school friendly because of that, right? If, you, if you're having a professor who studied the Kingdom of Congo for 10 years, they're gonna jam pack so many, so much into one lesson that I have to reach out to um, other experts who've had more expe experience teaching um, black history for, for a teenager or a young adult. I'm not too sure if I um, answered your question, but um, I'm no, gonna be happy to share the correct, at least the, the syllabus with you if you're interested. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Shares. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, happy Saturday. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, thank you, Ms. Henry, for your research, your input, and definitely for your cards that you and your students created. Um, those are, uh, in the words of the younger people, the bomb.com. Oh, well, um, with that said, uh, the, you kind of um, began or leaned into the uh, part of my inquiry, uh, which is about how have you slash how are you navigating, if any, um, potential resistance uh, to teaching this within your school, within your classroom, within your district? So, I mean, I'm fortunate because I'm in Philly. And I, so I don't get resistance in terms of um, the course itself. Now I've had had conflict um, with my own organization, like forcing me for the first time this year to um, give a benchmark, um, which I didn't necessarily agree with, but I had to do uh, no matter what. Um, my Vermont teachers, though, they talked a lot about the resistance that they got from admin and from parents. Um, and the advice that I gave to them often was to focus on the standard, because if you focus on the standard and the skill that's being taught, that can take away from perhaps what the content um, itself is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Conahan. So good morning to everyone. Um, Ms. Henry, I hope it goes without saying, um, I connected with you via social media about a year ago um, due to your role in the African-American Studies course, AP History course, um, and I've been a fan. So oh, this has been a long you. time coming. Um, I am a career K-12 educator, a law and doctoral student about to wrap up my journey. Um, so a lot of our focus aligns. Um, um, the brother Shax, I think, um, had a similar question. So I'm going to adjust in real time because I'm curious to hear how you consider resistance. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with the Philadelphia school system, and I know how that functions either similarly or separately from other school districts. And I'm, I'm mindful of this wave of anti-CRT legislation um, that we all need to acknowledge is just getting started. It's not going anywhere. Um, it's just changing its name. And I'm also mindful of the fact, Ms. Henry, that you are speaking to what I would argue is 
in my opinion, the most vulnerable population of educators, which are K-12 educators, they are simply not protected in ways that professors are. That's just a fact. Um, and so I'm curious to hear you sort of talk a bit about, um, I don't want to repeat the question from Shayx, but I, I want to sort of give a bit difference, a different nuance. Um, what are your thoughts around how standards and your approach to teaching this course, teaching the teachers, if you will, how that can protect them? Meaning the, the, the K-12 educators who teach certain courses um, are simply fired. They're simply penalized. They lose their jobs. That, that's mm -hmm. the reality of it. And they are not protected in ways that higher ed educators are. And so someone who is teaching this course has to have a level of awareness, grounding in standards to be able to, to protect themselves and keep their job. How, how, how either does or might your course um, address that sort of emancipatory approach to those teachers to ensure that they are thinking about standards? I'm just curious to hear how you approach that so that they are protecting themselves as opposed to putting themselves um, in a position to be really vulnerable. Because I heard you say at the top of your presentation that your population has changed in terms of students from overwhelmingly students of color. So I think you said this year, almost overwhelmingly white students, um, white and female. So what does that look like for um, someone who is teaching in Florida, who's teaching in Oklahoma, who wants to teach this course but would like to pay their, you know, yeah. car note and keep their job. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yes. I hope that makes Yes, it does. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. So, but just to clarify, my, like, I'm currently in Philadelphia right now. I teach ninth grade African-American history in person to 100% students of color. The course I developed for St. Mike's was a small liberal arts college where the students were nearly 100% white women. So I just want to clarify that point. Now, in terms of giving like advice over protection, um, I would also just want to add the word empowerment for teachers. I think part of what teachers need is simply the practice of teaching, not only teaching Black history, but having conversations around Black history. If you are a high school teacher and you have not take and you did not take a course on Black history in college you have not had a lot of dis like practice in terms of just general discussion with other people. And part of what the course just provides is a starting point in having those conversations. Because if you're not pra practicing those conversations, you, it's gonna be more difficult for you to defend yourself when you have an angry parent or if you have an admin pushing back against you. Um, so I would I would just say that the protection that's being that I am offering to teachers is by empowering them through through practice. Thank you. I'm not teaching at this time, but I'm also from Philadelphia. And I looked at your curriculum and right then West Philly, it's I, I, I hate to say it's old. We need to bring it a little more involved in reality. There are people mm. in your community. There are places in your community, even in West Philly, where you live. Because I taught one time in West Philly that you can expose those children to and stop doing the standard teaching of Black history. Yes, absolutely. There are so many people in the community that we are losing. There's such a great history in Philadelphia of Black mm -hmm. history that you did not even mention. Yes. I mean, and I picked it, I picked and choose for this presentation. I've developed a unit on Emily Davis. Like this year I had students, I've had students write letters about Taney Street being um, removed when they studied Dred Scott. There's definitely much other that I do related to local Black history. Um, I mean, I could have done a presentation, right, on just teaching Black history locally. What I wanted to provide today was just more of an overview of the curriculum that I've created for, for both settings. But you you are absolutely right, uh, Ms. Fields. There's so much rich history here in Philly. I've 
brought in guest speakers. We're going to go see the move exhibit if I can plan it out. Um, you know, some of those things too, just and the about teachers having are not time. Safe. The teachers are not safe teaching the truth here in Philadelphia. And let's be mm. honest about that. Mm. Some of them are being penalized. Some of them are not being told not to say certain things. Mm -hmm. This is here in Philadelphia. You have a, a curriculum that's I don't want to say sanitize, but even that, some of the teachers are not allowed to teach here, even in Philadelphia. That is and true. some of the charter schools, it's 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 pathetic. It it is pathetic because they're not allowing our children to be enriched by their own history, by their own people, by their own people's knowledge and to be able to explore even in the city of Philadelphia what's here that they need to know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm going to mute myself because as I said, I'm not teaching presently in the school, but I'm still spreading the word. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Douglas. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, Mrs. Henry, that was excellent. Um, I want to go on the back of Mrs. Fields, and I want to say it in uh, a way that it makes it practical. Looking at what you talked about when it comes to Abraham Lincoln and that the way that you pulled it together, I know that I sent you some stuff a little earlier, mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Sister Abigail. So the one thing about Abraham Lincoln that allows students to have a very defined conversation, is he abolitionist or is he anti-slavery? Mm -hmm. And we can lay those things out in a way that gives a definition that doesn't necessarily define as much, but gives some sort of um, standards. So from there, yeah. And there's a piece that Lerone Bennett wrote. It's called Force to Glory. Mm -hmm. And if you can extract some of that stuff, I think I remember mm -hmm. it. I've read it so many times and used it so many times. He said, yeah, Lincoln used the N-word. He told darky jokes in public, right? That's and this was on his way as he was being secretly snuck into Washington, D.C. to be inaugurated, right? So he said, the one thing I didn't want to deal with, with was this issue as the first issue. So those kind of things help the content connection. Um, one thing that was just talked about is, do you have an elder board? I know you talked about some of your contemporaries, but do you have an elder board of those folks who are still around that would be like we just heard from Mrs. Fields uh, that would be able to help you with some of those things directly? So I'll be willing to share my social capital. What I mean, like, you know, yes, we have yes. some of these folks that are still around that would be very interested because the problem for me as someone who works in higher ed is that there is no bridge program. Mm. So, I mean, we had this conversation the last time I was with you all. This idea of that, that means we can take this time because Dr. King has put it forth this effort to make this affordable to us, meaning we can uh -huh. get together and do it. Like, one thing that I would really like to do is see how and what times your class meets and have them coming to my classroom. Mm. Like that would be something that you could do a, a number of times a week, whatever days and times that will work for you. Cause I work with a young lady out of Louisville. You, you know, Mrs. Clay, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. King. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I took about two years to pull it all together. And as soon as we got it together, she left the, uh, the school system. So we have some boundaries with that already. We have some things laid out, but I would love to see how we could do that virtually to have them join a class like a 1,000 level class and a 4,000 level class. Those are the things that are really missing. These practical ways that we can get those things done. And as far as that, like with your elder board, it would be of great resource in a practical sense, but for you to have the conversations with some of those folks, like, you know, when we think about Raymond Wimbush, he's still around. Yeah, right? I was just with him a couple of days ago in Baltimore, but like he wrote the book, should America pay about reparation to have his thoughts. He would love to come into the classroom. So I know me teaching in 16 weeks is very arrogant of me to believe that my students should only hear from me mm. in a 16 week session. There's no way in an intro or even a defined course that I am a expert on all of these topics. Cause I don't consider my expert uh, expert on many topics, just someone who's continuing to learn. So in that regard, I think it's real important and i want to make sure that you and i have this clear lines of communication that can only grow from here 
So yeah. I want to offer that to you and in any other way, because what you're doing is the most important part. Folks talk about how we fill holes and we fill the gaps. That's the gap. I mean, Virginia students, for the most part, K through 12, have had nothing defined as African-American studies. Mm. Right. So a lot of that can be remedied just because we have the wherewithal, we have yes. the social capital, and Dr. King provided this platform. So I agree with what you're doing. I think it's very well laid out. And please understand that the way that you laid it out is higher level understanding of how to pull together a lesson plan. That's not average. So mm -hmm. I do appreciate the brilliance in it. Now, if I can be of any help, which means I can only ask you to work with me on this. Yes. But I would hope that you would figure how important this is and we can move forward in that way because I'm very much so um, tied to this space being important in ways that will leave things for folks that we'll never see. Yes, absolutely. I think that bridge is really important. I mean, like I said, like I can never, I can't be the expert on any one given to topic to the level of someone who got a PhD just on that topic. Let me stop That's, it right there. You absolutely so, can. You think I, somebody who I, studied Congo anybody for Anybody here with a PhD years? who doesn't agree with that, <laughs> that's arrogance, ego, and vanity. I'm mm -hmm. just being honest with you. Some of the most like entitled and lazy folks I met was in the PhD program, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know about you all. I went to a research one institution and all of that. But to be honest with you, that's a myth that we can break down with the bridge. Mm -hmm. Because what you all have to do to be able to put this into a lesson plan and yes. have it align with state standards is outside of what's asked for higher ed. So I push back on that in a way, like all the time. So for you to say that, I hope that you can understand my what? lens is not exactly the same when it comes to that. Yeah. I think you, what you all do, give you an example. There's a young lady out of Chicago. I don't know if you all have ever heard of Chicago Kenwood High School. And it's a, hey, good a selective doc. enrollment school. Hey, um, and, we're going to have to move forward. We're a little bit over time. We we have a few questions uh, left. So I hope to hear from you, Ms. Henry. You will, Mr. Douglas. And I'll be at the conference. Can't wait to meet you in person. All right, Ms. Scott. Uh, hello, um, I, I'm uh, Z Scott. I came in late, unfortunately, uh, but what I heard was very, very good. Thank you, uh, Ms. Henry. I would like a syllabus. Mm -hmm. I really like my situation. I am a teacher, professor, uh, but I am um, not teaching right now. I'm a Spanish teacher. I try to incorporate uh, black history through uh, language, uh, where it came from, uh, Spanish, how it evolved. Some of the words are uh, Arabic and how it evolved from the Moors of Africa and so forth and everything like that. I get a lot of resistance. I get resistance from <laughs> like, what are you talking about? This doesn't, that that's not true. Uh, I like what Ms. Fields said. She's right on the point. Uh, it's 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 just too much. It's just so much resistance. Yeah. What do we do for that reason? I, I published a book. Um, it's called Your Bread and Water, Food for the Soul, 30 historical uh, accounts on how African-Americans' generational wealth disappeared. Mm. That may be too much for high school students, but I'm 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 pushing it off to college students. But at this point, like Miss Fields, I mean, how long are we going to play this? I mean, let's just tell the truth. We can't have the sanitized version of things that are not true. And I mean, making this pretty and nice where they can deal with it. I mean, I can't do that. And that's why I think it's important to empower students to become activists for Black history education as much as possible. Small things like having my students create the teacher solidarity postcards um, allowed and permitted them to deeply engage with like the fact that their course was illegal. And <laughs> I just I think a small act of just creating a post postcard is an act of resistance itself. I agree. Yeah, I'm just frustrated about it because Same. it's been pushed down under the rug for so long. And uh, I, it looks like our our objective in life is to 
uh, make the dominant race feel comfortable so we'll feel safe. Like mm -hmm. the story mm -hmm. of the magical, uh, the American Society of Magical Negroes. Right. We are going around making them feel comfortable so we'll feel safe in our jobs or, or whatever. But when does the truth come out? I mean, they know a lot of this stuff, but it stays buried. And we can't move forward. This is why I did this book. Um, it's got to come forward. I mean, I think we need to go after the administration. It's got to it's got to be a conjoined force. Yeah, it I, just goes after this because even in colleges, they're talking about African Africana studies. That's fine too, but what about Black history in the United States? I mean, students, everyone students is using Black history. It. Everyone is using the struggle that black people do to pivot on, to get up higher on the, all the immigrants, all of them are using that. Even, even the Africans, I know Africa is the big continent, all that stuff, but I mean, let's just get real about the whole thing. I can't play the game anymore. We have students at my school where they are penalized. They won't even have a black studies program. They have to do it after school or whatever. It's just disgusting. Uh, Dr. King. I'm sorry. That was oh, all. No, no, you're fine. And uh, last question. I saw Marsha hand was up for a little bit. It was, yeah, uh, but I just, I, I just really put the question in the chat because hmm. I, I'm wondering with all of the, the wealth of knowledge that we get on these, on these um, webinars or these calls, if we could think about a collective where we are coming together and we're producing these things, where I, I'm fortunate enough to have gone to school in Detroit during a time where during the 10th grade, African-American history and literature was taught. And after the state takeover and some other things happened, that is no longer the practice. But there are there are classes, African-American history classes that students can take, but they tend not to take those classes because you need 18 credits to graduate and that's what they focus on. So my question really was, um, and I'm not sure because I also came on late, like if there is a collective or there's a group of people who are who continue to come on these calls where we can start producing something across the nation that showcases um, mm. and, it, and it also enforces how we feel about the study of African American history, I had to do something very similar. I work in Detroit, like I said, but I had a large Mexican American population. They didn't know they fought in the Civil War. Like, so there are certain things they didn't know that mm -hmm. that, that slave, enslaved people were escaping and going to Mexico. They don't, a lot of people don't get all of these connections. And so maybe if we think about collectively putting our resources together, we might be able to extend and make something where the nation, the world, the universe um, has to stop and take stock. So that was my question. Well, I think Donovan had a, a beautiful response to that in, in the chat. Part of it, you know, we're, we're starting it right here. And by coming to the conference as well is, um, will only help us build uh, more fellowship. Yeah. Professor Kink, thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, and since I'm the HNIC, I can uh, create something before the conference. So uh, I can like during the same time as the writing retreat and social studies coordinators retreat, we can have a think tank. So if you all are interested in that, let us know. Um, and I can, you know, set something up, um, you know, and have a think tank maybe two days before the conference for those mm -hmm. who would like to continue going to the conference or you just want to attend the think tank, right? So you all just let me know. Um, you know, email me and we can definitely, you know, set up something real quick. Uh, 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 Ronisha, really quick. What we got? Yeah, just uh, real quick to, um, in regards to a collective and creating a repository on um, teachathena.org or um, app.teachathena. It's in the uh, chat. There is already um, those who began teaching the AP seminar with African diaspora content. We have a collection of uh, lessons there as well. It's free. It's wide open to anyone um, to have access to it and to join it. And um, if anybody has any questions about it, I can guide you on it too. Great, and I'll great. 
So I'll send all of that uh, via email for everyone who registered. Um, well, I, I'll 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 send the chat transcript. All right. All right. So we're a little bit over time, um, which is great or whatever. Great, great, great. Uh, I think Abigail put another link in there for you all to kind of click on real quick. Renisha put her email there for you all to get the um, African diaspora um, resources there. Um, uh, so grab those really quick. Um, and if and if there's nothing else, I'm going to have to end. But uh, 15 minutes, if you are going to the book club, last book club, um, Black Lives Matter in Schools, um, two of the authors are going to be there to answer all of your questions and also present. So you all can kind of uh, start going over there. Um, and I'll see all of you all uh, at the conference this summer. Uh, if y'all need anything or have any questions, feel free to email me and I will try my best to get back with you um, on those things. Uh, and again, once again, we, we appreciate your uh, support uh, throughout the year. Um, and we hope to see everybody at, at the conference in Buffalo, July 20. Um, what's the date? 26 through the 28th. All right. Bye. All right, let me stop recording here.